On St. David's Day, 1915, a group of young guardsmen stood on this very spot, ready to mount their first King's Guard at Buckingham Palace. Their new regiment, the Welsh Guards, had been raised just a few days previously by King George V. Well, a hundred years later, the Welsh Guards are marking a century of distinguished service and tradition. The 1st Battalion will be taking centre stage by trooping the colour at the Queen's Birthday Parade. So in this notable year for the Welsh Guards, an exceptionally busy year, a central role for the men of the 1st Battalion in the Queen's Birthday Parade of 2015. Today's escort provided by the Prince of Wales' company. It's always a great honour, of course, but in this centenary year, the company is representing the traditions of the entire regiment. So the expectations are even higher than usual. Now, this year also marks an important milestone for the parade. It's the first time in over a decade that the Household Division has not been deployed on operations either in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Just a few weeks ago, Horse Guards Parade hosted a major event to commemorate the 70th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. And in September this year, the Queen is set to become the longest reigning monarch in British history. So, 2015 is indeed a year of remarkable milestones. The birthday parade begins and ends at Buckingham Palace. Her Majesty will be accompanied in unrivalled style by the Sovereign's escort. We expect them to depart in around 15 minutes' time. And then, after the magnificent display of Trooping the Colour, the Queen will return to the palace, where the royal family will appear on that famous balcony to enjoy the traditional birthday fly-past. Everything ready on the Mall for the Royal Processions, an impressive display of Union flags leading all the way to Horse Guards Parade. And the streetliners of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards are smartly in place. We have live coverage for you of all the events here on BBC One, along with interviews with some of those taking part, and there is unedited coverage available on the red button. Here in Horse Guards, over 7,000 spectators are settling in for a great experience. They are the lucky ones because there were more than 11,000 applications for tickets this year. There is another great vantage point, and uh, that is on the eastern fringe of St James's Park, always a popular spot. Uh, and one section there is reserved for the younger spectators, and my colleague Claire Balding is with them. Hugh, for all the history and the tradition of this event, I think it's the spectators that make it special. And in this youth enclosure, we've got over a thousand members of various youth organisations. We've got cubs here, we've got scouts, we've got brownies, we've got guides. This group here are from Aberdeen, the first time ever in London. And this is the girls' brigade, all looking forward to a fabulous day. Who are you wanting to see the most? And there we have it. Well, not long to wait. A word about the Welsh Guards from the battlefields of the Great War to more recent deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the Welsh Guards have distinguished themselves in a full century of service since their formation back in 1915. And the pride of those who've served is evident in every generation. The Welsh Guards have been a massive part of my life since joining in 1998. And to be on the centenary year, to do the troop is uh, is quite special to me. Well, I didn't fancy any other regiment. Being Welsh, I wanted to become a Welsh Guardsman. The Welsh Guard is a family unit. You mightn't think so, but there is always someone there looking after you all the time. I spent 22 years in the Welsh Guards. If I could have stayed, I would have stayed. You were stationed with other regiments, but yours was the regiment. I'm very proud of what I've achieved, uh, ceremonial and operational. I've served one tour of Iraq, two tours of Afghan, two tours of Bosnia, and several of Northern Ireland. I was 100 last December, and everywhere I go, 
I'm introduced was the oldest living Welsh Guardsman. Very proud indeed. I did Troop into the Colour in 1934 and 35. A wonderful experience that was. My first Troop in the Colour was in uh, 1965. The Welsh Guards, Guards 1 and 2, who are here, are in fact going out to Aden in October. Doing it in a Welsh Guards uniform with a lot of Welsh Guardsmen around you, all your mates, more or less, sticking our chests out. I was over the moon. F first time putting it, putting all the gear on, your tunic, your bearskin and all that, informing your parents, watch for me on TV, which was another excitement part. When you see it, of course, you think back to when you were actually on it yourself, what you did and what you should have done. <laughs> on the parade square itself, uh, you know, um, we've got to work as a team keep it together, well disciplined, just, just as we are when we're on conflict in operations. Such a rich tradition and Colour Sergeant Gareth Green there in place next to the escort has an impressive record. This is the sixth time he's taken part in the birthday parade. But sitting next to me is someone whose experience of the parade is of a different order. My special guest, Major General Richard Stanford, one of the very few officers to have commanded the parade on two occasions. There he is back in 2007. He had the unique honour as a Welsh Guardsman of commanding the parade when the Coldstream Guards were trooping their colour. And then the following year, he returned as field officer in brigade waiting, this time commanding his own Welsh Guards. A very warm welcome, Richard. What are you looking forward to today? Today's a fantastic day, a unique privilege for us as Guardsmen to troop our colour and march past Her Majesty the Queen. A lot of effort and preparation has gone into today and hopefully what we'll now see is that effort and preparation paying off. And that of course has been supported by those you see today on parade and those behind the scenes, the families and friends who've supported the Guardsmen on parade to get them to where they are today. We're looking forward to it, Richard, thank you. And that sense of the Welsh Guards, as you say, as a close-knit family regiment will be felt very strongly today. Let's join Claire once again. Watching proudly from the stands will be Nicola Bick, because who is on parade? Uh, my husband, Douglas Bick, and my brother, Jack Owen. And do you know what they're doing? Uh, my husband is escorting the colours, but I'm not too sure what my brother's doing, to be honest. And we hear a lot about the Welsh Guards being very, very supportive to families. How? I think there's a great community um, within where we are situated. Um, there is a, a couple of wives who arrange certain um, groups and activities for us so we can get to know each other. We're not just sat in the house waiting for the husband to come home. So, yeah, that's great. So does that mean that you're surrounded by friends today? Um, yeah, I'm getting to know more and more people um, the longer I'm there. So, yeah, it is good to have them all here. And how big a moment is this for your husband and your brother? Um, I think they're both very proud to be on there, as we are with them as well. Yeah, it's a special moment for us all. Lovely. Well, enjoy the day. I will do. Thank you very much. Just a sense of the excitement and the pride uh, among the people here today. So let's take a look at the guards formed up for today's parade. You've mentioned the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards. They're providing the men for the escort as well as for number two guard and number three guard. Let's have a look at the far end. Formed up at right angles, we have number seven company, Coldstream Guards. They are providing number six guard today. And then next to them, there's number five guard, provided by F Company Scots Guards. And then we have number four guard, provided by Nijmegen Company Grenadier Guards. Each guard comprised of three officers and 70 men, apart from the escort, that is, which has an additional six men. Grenadier Guards, as I mentioned, are on street lining duty today and the Irish Guards are represented not only by some of the musicians in the mass bands but also by their regimental adjutant, Colonel Tim Purden, and of course by their Royal Colonel, the Duke of Cambridge, and we'll be seeing him in the procession shortly. The colour party is in place and their main duty is to protect the colour being trooped today, that is the Queen's colour of the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards. And those new colours presented uh, to the regiment by the Queen at Windsor in April on a nice sunny day. And uh, Her Majesty said that no 100th birthday greeting would give her greater pleasure during the course of this year.
It is the indomitable family spirit of the Welsh Guards that has been your hallmark. I know too that the support and devotion of the regimental family remains as strong as ever. I feel sure that these new colours, which I look forward to seeing trooped on my official birthday in June, will inspire you and your successors to emulate the deeds of Welsh Guardsmen of the past hundred years. The colour carries uh, 21 of the regiment's 47 battle honours. And today's colour party comprises the sergeant of the escort, Sergeant Kieran Cunningham, who has recovered from a gunshot injury sustained in Helmand back in 2012. And he's flanked by the two sentries to the colour, Lance Corporal Kyle Purvis, the right sentry, and Lance Corporal Adam Carr, who's the left sentry today. Now, the officer commanding today's parade is uh, the field officer in brigade waiting to give him his formal title, Lieutenant Colonel Giles Harris, and he has the daunting task of memorising and delivering more than 100 commands. He's been talking to Claire. I'm in the stables with two key personnel for today's Queen's Birthday Parade, because this is Winston, he's 21, and just as important, the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Giles Harris. Um, Giles, Winston knows what he's doing. Is that good for you or not? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's great for me. It's a great comfort to know that he's done this before, two, two times before. Um, the only small issue we do have is he knows the praise so well that sometimes he does things a little bit early and not when he's told to. But uh, I think it's a net gain. He's, he's, he's very good. Can you relax and enjoy this and think how proud you are? Yeah, I, th I think I should relax and enjoy it. It's easier said than done and there's a lot going on. Uh, we all want it to go really, really well. We're very, we're very proud to be doing this in our 100th year. And it is, for, for all of the Welsh Guards, this is a great moment. Yeah, it's a fantastic moment. A lot of rehearsal, a lot of hard work um, has gone into today. And I think everyone's really looking forward to putting on a really, you know, really good show and what's a really big year for us. Well, best of luck to you and Winston. Make sure you behave. Yes, indeed, we wish him well uh, in today's remarkable duties that he has and the great honour, of course, that uh, he carries today. Um, someone else who's entitled to feel considerable pride today is the captain of the escort, Major James Aldridge, because he features in the Queen's Birthday Honours today, receiving the MBE for military services. The subaltern of the escort is Captain Alex Major, who deployed uh, to Afghanistan in 2012 and is currently second in command of the Prince of Wales's company. And then the ensign is Lieutenant Ed Clark. We'll have more about Lieutenant Ed Clark later, commissioned to the 1st Battalion in December 2030. At Buckingham Palace, the first carriage procession is about to leave. In the first carriage, we have the Duchess of Cambridge, the Duchess of Cornwall and Prince Harry. Today is the Duchess of Cambridge's first official engagement uh, since the birth of Princess Charlotte. Her Royal Highness Princess Charlotte of Cambridge, six weeks old. Uh, her brother Prince George will be two years old next month on the 22nd of July. And Prince Harry there who announced uh, just a few months ago that he would be leaving the armed forces after a decade of full-time service. In the second carriage we have the Duke of York and his daughters Princess Beatrice and Princess Eugenie. Then uh, in the third carriage, Duke of Kent, the Duke of Gloucester, and the Duchess of Gloucester. His Royal Highness Duke of Kent, Colonel of the Scots Guards. He's held that appointment since 1974, and that makes him the longest serving Colonel of any of the Guards regiments. Plenty of smiles as the uh, royal party greets those who've crowded around Buckingham Palace, Queen's Gardens there, around the Queen Victoria Memorial, ready for that procession along the Mall. Up to Horse Guards Parade. Prince Harry may be saying, it's a little chilly today, and I have to say it's overcast. A few specks of rain this morning. Um, so for those people watching in the stands at Horse Guards and those lining the Mall, 
maybe not quite as comfortable, but for the men on parade, certainly the conditions should be pretty good. All eyes now on Buckingham Palace for the Queen's departure. The Royal Salute, sounded by Trooper Stephen McRitchie of the Lifeguards, the field officer's trumpeter of the Sovereign's Escort. And here we have Her Majesty attending her 63rd birthday parade. And uh, that's a record unmatched by any other monarch in British history. Her Majesty, who celebrated her 89th birthday on the 21st of April this year. Today, of course, is the official birthday. She spent her actual birthday quietly in Windsor. At her side once again, the Duke of Edinburgh, who celebrated his 94th birthday just a few days ago. Also in the procession are the three royal colonels, the Duke of Cambridge, Prince of Wales and the Princess Royal. Duke of Cambridge in his fifth year riding as Colonel of the Irish Guards, the Prince of Wales celebrating his 40th year as Colonel of the Welsh Guards and the Princess Royal, Colonel of the Blues and Royals since 1998. The Queen and the Duke making their way around the Great memorial there to Queen Victoria outside Buckingham Palace and uh, heading for the vast stretch of the Mall up towards Admiralty Arch before they turn right onto the approach road into Horse Guards Parade. In September this year, Her Majesty is set to break that remarkable record set by Queen Victoria as the longest reigning monarch in British history at 63 years and seven months. The Queen and the Duke, both great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria. And uh, Queen Victoria, by the way, who attended just the one birthday parade at Windsor in 1895, when the Scots Guards were trooping their colour, it was the Queen's 76th birthday. So Victoria's record not quite in the same league as the Queen's. Duchess of Cornwall and the Duchess of Cambridge and uh, Prince Harry have made their progress pretty swiftly and they're almost at the uh, parade ground. It's a busy year for the royal family. The Duchess of Cornwall and the Prince of Wales will be visiting Belgium next week. Uh, part of the events to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. There are several major events to commemorate that. And the uh, Duchess of Cornwall and the Prince of Wales will attend that service, a memorial service at uh, St. Paul's next week uh, to mark that 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. 
Duchess of Cambridge there who visited the Irish Guards on the 17th of March to present them with the traditional shamrocks for St David's Day, uh, for St Patrick's Day, I beg your pardon. Um, too many Welsh Guards around today. And she was joined at the parade by the Duke of Cambridge there, Royal Colonel. And Prince Harry who uh, travelled to Turkey in April to join his father, the Prince of Wales, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings. Around 21,000 British troops were killed in the landings in 1915. First carriages on the parade ground. Guards formation having changed. Number three guard had opened the way to make room for the first royal guests. And uh, Prince Harry's uh, Blues and Royals uniform there decorated with the wings of the Army Air Corps, his Diamond Jubilee Medal and his Afghanistan Campaign Medal and the KCVO insignia. He's a Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, was presented by the Queen last week and they are heading for the horse guards building where the royal party will watch the parade from the room once occupied by the duke of wellington now the office of the major general and richard um we have a pretty good view but that's also a pretty good view it's rather a special office it's got uh, wellington's desk in it which is still used by the major general uh, commanding london district and the household division and also wellington's death mask but as you say, it has a very good view, and the Major General there to oversee the Household Division, an excellence in action, keeps an eye on what goes on in Horse Guards, and of course the Royal Family are going to enjoy that view today. Such an impressive sight. The Sovereign's Escort, one of the uh, great displays of the day. Seven officers and 111 warrant officers, non-commissioned officers and troopers. Leading the procession is the Brigade Major, Lieutenant Colonel Simon Soskin, with four troopers of the lifeguards. The Brigade Major responsible for delivering uh, the state ceremonial and public duties in London, and this is Simon's last year in that role. Third and final Queen's Birthday Parade after two and a half years as a Brigade Major. And the 10 minutes that I ride down the Mall at the head of Her Majesty's procession is the highlight of my year. I'll be thinking about the timing, because that's my main role, to help deliver Her Majesty to the dais at exactly the right moment. But I'll also be thinking about the work that the men and women who are conducting the parade have put in over the last few weeks. They've worked very, very hard, and it will be an immaculate parade. It's a centenary of the formation of the Welsh Guards. The Welsh Guards are trooping their colour, and it will be an absolute cracker. Simon Soskin, the Brigade Major. Is it fair to say, Richard, that his main task today is to keep an eye on his watch? Absolutely. He has the task of making sure Her Majesty arrives on parade at exactly 11 o'clock. So the Brigade Major followed by four troopers of the lifeguards. And the retinue, by the way, interesting to note, chosen from the top finishers, the smartest contestants, if you like, of the... Princess Elizabeth Cup, that is the regiment's annual turnout competition. The mounted band, led by the Director of Music, Major Craig Hallett, appointed Director of Music, uh, the Band of the House of Cavalry, in February this year. And the musicians, of course, always resplendent in their gold state kit, known for their very high standards of musicianship and horsemanship.
first and second divisions of the Sovereign's Escort provided this year by the lifeguards with their distinctive red tunics and white plumes. Four officers, 57 mounted dutymen riding 61 horses. And then the third and fourth divisions of the Sovereign's Escort provided by the Blues and Royals with their dark blue tunics and red plumes. Three officers, 54 mounted dutymen riding 57 horses. And by the way, the tradition of using the household cavalry to escort the sovereign to the parade is a relatively recent one, actually. Uh, it was introduced by King George VI in 1937. Duke of Edinburgh first rode in the parade in 1953 in the full dress uniform of a field marshal. Since then, he's always attended in the uniform of a colonel. He became colonel of the Welsh Guards in 1954 and uh, later Colonel of the Grenadier Guards. The Royal Colonels, among them the Duke of Cambridge, who left operational service in the armed forces in September 13, after seven and a half years of full-time military service. And then the Prince returned to work at the end of May this year as a pilot with the East Anglian Air Ambulance um, after taking a bit of a break for the uh, recent birth of his uh, daughter. Prince of Wales too, um, who made that historic visit to Northern Ireland recently. He met and shook hands with uh, the Sinn Féin leader, Gerry Adams. And the Princess Royal, important to note that she is celebrating 45 years this year as president of Save the Children and she visited the Philippines recently where she spent much of that trip visiting projects supported by Save the Children. The mounted band settling into position, they'll make a compelling and dramatic entry a little later on in this parade. And the Sovereign's escort, the lifeguards, making their way down the approach road along to horse guards. And then the Queen, just passing there on the left, you'll see the left, the youth enclosure, where Claire was a little earlier. An enthusiastic welcome there for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. More than a thousand of them, happily waving the flags, and uh, a little red dragon there just reminding us that the Welsh Guards have a uh, prominent position today. Her Majesty is Colonel-in-Chief of every regiment in the Household Division. And it's worth pointing out that uh, Her Majesty is a daughter and wife and mother and grandmother of those who've served or who have served or uh, are currently serving in the armed forces. Majesty's carriage crosses onto the parade ground. Queen's very experienced head coachman is Jack Hargreaves. Ninth occasion he's driven to the Queen's uh, birthday parade. He spent 23 years in the army. And he will salute the colour in his unique way with the whip. And the three Royal Colonels will salute as they come onto the parade ground. Followed by the two non-Royal Colonels.
of the Queen's. First task is to inspect the line of guards. And senior Director of Music, Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Roberts of the Welsh Guards, appointed in March this year. changes to The Welshman, which is another selection of traditional Welsh tunes by a former director of music, town colonel Peter Hannam. The Queen is wearing the brooch of the Brigade of Guards. Its motto, Quinque Juncta in Uno, five joined in one, featuring the badges of the five foot guards regiments, was made initially for Queen Mary. Household Cavalry, the only regiments allowed to present a sovereign standard on today's parade. Inscribed on the standard are the regiment's battle honours and the royal coat of arms. And this year it's the sovereign standard of the lifeguards. The standard bearer is Squadron Corporal Major James Fitzgerald, who has served in the lifeguards uh, since 1989. Soon past the King's Troop, who will make a thrilling contribution to the parade later on. And their lead gun is in effect their colour, has the same status, which is why the head coachman is saluting. The major of the parade is Major Tom Parsons, commissioned into the Scots Guards in 2001. The ensign for the Queen's Birthday Parade in 2002, second in command of the Welsh Guards in July 2014. And the man in charge of all the troops on parade, Major General Commanding Household Division, Major General Edward Smith Osborne. Riding Merlin today, he's been Major General since 2013. So a very proud day for Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Roberts, his first birthday parade as Senior Director of Music. He represents the very rich musical tradition of the regiment. He's just the fifth Welsh Guards Director of Music to be appointed Senior Director.
Well, this year is my first year as the Senior Director of Music of the Household Division. To stand on horse guards in front of a mass bands of 200 stunning musicians, it is the pinnacle of a career. Throughout the whole of the Queen's Birthday Parade, there are Welsh music elements, and we're very keen that the Welsh guards who are on parade feel the sense of pride in their regimental music. And to be doing this in the Welsh Guards centenary year is just outstanding. Well, we are hardly impartial observers, Richard, when it comes to Welsh music, but uh, we can expect some very good tunes today. We can indeed. There are going to be some wonderful arrangements with a Welsh theme and a link to Waterloo, of course, as well. Uh, it'll display the skill and flair of directors of music, past and present. Uh, and music's important to this parade. It's there to raise the spirits. And I, I defy anybody not to march past Her Majesty and stand a little taller, march a little taller to the regimental quick and slow march. But of course, music is a little bit more important than just raising spirits. It's a key part to keeping step. And the bass drummer, particularly the lead bass drummer, Ansel Brocklehurst from the Scots Guards, is key to making sure that the parade and the guards remain in step. Well, the mass bands preparing to play one of the most enduringly popular military marches, Les Huguenots been part of the parade since 1871. Sergeant Charles Hancock, centre trombone, gives the signal for the mass bands to change direction and counter march.
quick march is Canatex, composed by Sir Vivian Dunn, the only man to be knighted by the Queen for services to military music. At one time, he was director of music of the Royal Marines Band on the Royal Yacht back in the 1930s. The lone drummer breaking away there is Lance Corporal Christopher Rees from My Stig in South Wales, marching to a position to the right of the escort, ready for the next phase of this parade. And this is the second time for him in this role. He joined the Welsh Guards in 2008, and he's completed two operational tours in Afghanistan. drummer playing eight bars of a field signal called the drummer's call, recalling an age when all battlefield commands were given by drumbeat. And the orderly guardsman Stephen Monell marches forward to take the pace stick from regimental Sergeant Major Paul Dunn, who can then draw his sword, ready to protect the colour in the next stage of the parade. Captain Alex Major gives the order for the escort to take up their dressing in close order. That is a tighter formation for the march forward to collect the colour. On the eyes front, perfectly achieved. Escort for the colour. We'll advance. By the left. Quick march.
So the escort steps off very smartly to the rousing march of the British Grenadiers, stretching their legs, taking centre stage on their way to escort the colour, showing the results of weeks of hard work, and they'll hold 16 paces in front of the colour, ready for the collection to take place. It's a very proud moment for them, Richard. It most certainly is. The mass bands have set the scene, and now we get on to the actual preparation for the trooping the colour through the ranks. Mass bands have turned around to face the colour party and the senior director of music makes his way through the band. And such a big moment for Regimental Sergeant Major Paul Dunn. After 23 years of service, he's from Geirwen and is Morn or Anglesey. He's uh, preparing to take possession of the colour, protecting it with his sword, ready to hand it over safely then to the ensign, Lieutenant Ed Clark. Neat and uh, crisp transfer. Lieutenant Ed Clark receives the colour, places it in his white colour belt. Escort to the colour! Preset! So we're about to enter the central phase of this birthday parade as the escort prepares to troop the colour through the ranks.
But You'll have noticed that it's no longer the escort for the colour. It's now the escort to the colour. Now that the colour has been safely received. The escort advances in slow time. The bands play Escort to the Colour by Richard Ridings, played at this point in the parade since 1978. And this is the point at which the bands have to negotiate a rather daunting manoeuvre. I suppose you could call it the military equivalent of a three-point turn. It's known as the spin wheel. So we have some 200 musicians supported by 40 members of the Corps of Drums having to change direction without changing formation. It's a bit of uh, black magic, if you like. Escort prepares to troop its colour. And a big moment too for the field officer at this point, Richard. It certainly is. Shortly the mass bands will move. The field officer will have to do a rather long rain back, which is one of the more difficult parts of this parade. But he's been practicing this with Winston for a long time. So the music changes to the familiar Grenadier slow march arranged by Fred Harris as the escort prepares to troop the colour through the ranks. And it's a good moment for us now, at this central part of the parade, to, to reflect on what the colour represents. The colour represents the spirit of the regiment. Our forebears have fought under it and for it. It's always saluted, it's always protected wherever it goes, and it's a rallying point for the regiment. And interestingly today, just looking around the crowds, it's a rallying point for veterans as well. You notice veterans from the Welsh Guards from the Second World War, Aden, Northern Ireland, the Falklands, Afghanistan, Iraq. So they've rallied round today, both veterans and serving. And it's worth noting most of the battle honours are on the colour itself. Uh, they certainly are. Not all of them, but most of them are on there. And of course, the most recent one was the Falklands from 1982. And indeed, uniquely, there are three Welsh Guardsmen on parade today who fought in the Falklands. Garrison Sergeant Major, Chief of Staff of London District, and the Regiment of Welsh Guards. And of course, there is a fourth person on parade, which is the Duke of York. Uh, no doubt there are others, and there are many others in the stands as well. Well, of course, it's a real test for the guardsmen chosen to carry the colour. The ensign, Lieutenant Ed Clark, watched now by millions around the world, perhaps more important by his family and friends in the crowd today. The colour itself is incredibly heavy, and so in order to prepare for that, the practice colour that we use is, is slightly heavier than the real thing. So on the day itself, you're able to, to flourish without any hiccups, hopefully. My family are going to be coming to, to the birthday parade, which I'm very, very happy about. Uh, my brother in particular, he's, he's hoping to follow in my footsteps. Um, and, and absolutely, his, his plans are to join the battalion, so hopefully soon there'll be a, another set of brothers serving with the Welsh girls. I mentioned that the Queen had presented new colours at Windsor in April. One question viewers may want to ask is what happens to the colours they replace? The old colours are laid up and uh, they're laid up around Wales or around the country in churches that are chosen by the regiment. This year they'll be laid up on the 24th of September in St Mary's Church in Carnarvon. Carnarvon Castle of course is where the Prince of Wales was invested to be Prince of Wales. 
So that's rather a nice connection with him being 40 years as our colonel as well. Numbers one, two, five, God will return. Up, up, turn. At the hole, right bomb. Familiar music played by the Corps of Drums at this stage, composed shortly after the Second World War by Drum Major Tom Burkett of the Coldstream Guards. So the trooping phase is complete and the march past in slow time is about to begin. This is the neutral slow march, is called Parade March by the great French composer Charles Gounod. Last played, by the way, at the birthday parade in 1867. And uh, Gounod is said to have heard the music played at Hyde Park Barracks by the band of the First Lifeguards. This arrangement by the late uh, Fred Godfrey of the Coastal Guards.
all of the Welsh Guardsmen on parade today, acutely aware of the significance, not just of this occasion, the birthday parade, but of this year for them. Because uh, Welsh Guards were raised by order of George V back in February of 1915, and they saw active service just six months later on the Western Front. It's a rich tradition and distinguished service to mark and to celebrate today as well, Richard. Absolutely, we were raised in war and very shortly after being raised we were forged in battle at the Battle of Luz in September and there was a lot of pressure on those people at the time who were formed from across the army but a lot of our founding members came from the Household Division, a lot from the Grenadiers uh, and we picked up some of our traditions from them, I'm glad to say we've left some of their habits behind like their inability to say yes or no. They won't thank you for that. <laughs> Probably not, no. But we have a lot to thank them for because over 300 members of the Grenadiers uh, joined the Welsh Guards right at the start. And in that first battle at the Battle of Luce, there was a lot of pressure on those going into battle not to let their fellow Welshmen down and not to let the Household Division down as well. And I'm glad to say that at that battle at Luce in 1915, they achieved every objective that they were set. Field officer, Lieutenant Colonel Giles Harris, and the major of the parade, Major Tom Parsons, leading the way. First Battalion Welsh Guards trooped their colour in 1949. That was the first year after the war that the parade was carried out in the full glory of these scarlet tunics and bearskins because the first birthday parade after the war was in 47 and that was done in battle dress. Welsh Guards trooped their colour for Her Majesty the Queen for the first time 50 years ago in 1965. At that time the Queen was riding on parade at Horse Guards accompanied by the Duke of Edinburgh who at that time was Colonel of the Welsh Guards. as they prepare to pass the Queen. It's a good moment to underline the very direct and intense relationship between the Guards and Her Majesty. We're uniquely placed to be able to conduct this parade in front of Her Majesty. It's a real honour to be able to march past Her Majesty and look her in the eye when one marches past. And so there we are marching off in front of uh, Her Majesty. She does have an exacting eye. She will be taking in everything that is going on in this parade and Her Majesty will pass on her pleasure or displeasure depending on how it goes later. Music changes to the Welsh Guard Slow March. Men of Harlech. The ensign lowers the standard, passing the Queen, it's known as the Flourish. Cymru and Bith, prominently displayed on the standard there, Wales forever. sign raises it, that's known as the Recover. Prince of Wales is celebrating 40 years as Colonel of the Welsh Guards. He succeeded his father back in 1975. We're very lucky to have His Royal Highness as our Colonel. He cares passionately about the regiment and about the Guardsmen as well. And he's been particularly 
kind and generous to those who've been wounded and to those of the families of the, of the fallen as well. He cares passionately and it comes through loud and clear in all that he does for us as Welsh Guardsmen and indeed the other regiments of whom he's Colonel in Chief. Changes to the Scots Guard slow march, the garb of Old Gaul. And the Coldstream Guard slow march, the familiar Figaro by Mozart. Adjutant of the parade is Captain Charles Beer of the Welsh Guards. And rather than follow his father into the Royal Marines, Captain Beer decided to follow his grandfather into the Household Division. Uh, his grandfather was in the Life Guards and served in Palestine uh, during the Second World War. And he's learned to ride, especially uh, for today's parade. So the field officer rides out to salute the Queen now that the slow march past is complete. There's the field officer saluting Her Majesty before he then moved down to the corner to break into quick time. We're listening to Lord Wellington's March, which was composed by Princess Charlotte of Wales. We're now talking a long time ago. Uh, the only child of George IV and Caroline of Brunswick, gifted musician, and it was suggested by Prince Charles for use on today's parade um, because, of course, we are marking the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo. So we've already enjoyed the precision of the drill in the slow troop, but the escort is aiming for perfection in every activity today. We joined them recently to see how they've been preparing. My name's Garsman Singleton, I'm on the Prince of Wales's company and this year we will be manning the escort to the colour. Rehearsals this year has been a lot more stressful, pretty much because it's centenary year, everyone wants everything to be on point, so uh, the Regiment of Sarmage Major wants uh, more rehearsals to get everything perfect pretty much for the day. My brother, he was in the Welsh Guards before me, he was in mortars for eight years and he told me it was brilliant, so that's where uh, I joined. The toughest moment of the birthday parade is when you have to stand still for a long duration of time, basically discipline within yourselves and within the members of the actual guard itself. To be honest, you don't really see the crowd, you don't realise the cameras are on you or anything. You're just concentrating on doing what you do, make sure you, you're the smartest you can be. On the day of the birthday parade, it will be a different atmosphere for us. It's kind of like, yeah, this is it. This is, this is our time now. Just a sense of the preparation there, because there are one or two tricky moments in this parade. There are indeed. We're about to change from the slow march to the quick march, and this is where the teamwork really matters with the band and the troops. Quick time. Quick march. And there we have it, expertly done. Band and guards working together. So we're ready for the march passing quick time. Style changing and the tempo quickens, a new sense of dynamism. The neutral quick march is Toc H. It's uh, composed by Joseph Mansfield of the Irish Guards.
so many Welsh Guardsmen on parade today and a story I love to share with people and uh, you can underline it Richard is the fact that there are fewer surnames in Wales I suppose lots of Joneses and Davises and Thomases so there's a way to get around that. There certainly is it can get somewhat confusing with only about six names on the nominal roll uh, so known each other by the last two numbers or on occasion by the last three numbers if two are the same it's slightly odd to other people uh, outside the regiment to understand that people call each other by two numbers. But um, one anecdote when I returned from operations once, uh, were families are there to meet us, and the Scots Guardsman with us, who's bemused when 16's mother called him by his last two numbers as well. <laughs> and uh, in good Welsh Guards humour, there's a few jokes that go in there as well. So. Peugeot is known as Peugeot because of his last two numbers, 205. <laughs> so there's plenty of uh, jokes in there. Well, in that spirit, the, the right marker of number three guard, by the way, Sergeant Matthew Davis is, surprise, surprise, Davis 96. Yeah, yeah Sergeant Davis 96, who's uh, been around for a while left the joining recently re left the army and recently rejoined the Welsh Guards which is great to see him back well among those uh, joined the parade in the stands the Prime Minister and his wife Samantha Mr Cameron of course just uh, a month or so since uh, he was re-elected to number 10 for a second five-year term some Commonwealth uh, heads of government in the stands as well as Mr Cameron's guests Michael Fallon there the Defence Secretary Lots of interest, of course, in the spending settlement for his department in uh, next month's budget and the months ahead. March passed in quick time. Almost ready to pass the saluting base and Her Majesty once again. Welsh Guards quick march, Codia de Rehedith, the rising of the lark. The Queen acknowledges the colour. And a word about number three company as they approach. During the Second World War, they acquired the nickname the Little Iron Men due to the fact that uh, number three company traditionally has the smallest men in the battalion, though. Captain of number three guard, Major Tim Badham, is six feet four, I think, Richard. Yes, we seem to have a tradition of that. All the uh, shorter guards will go to number three company, but they uh, have a habit of putting the taller guards, the taller guards officers, into that company. In fact, it was my first company as well. Quick march of the Grenadier Guards, the British Grenadiers. Four number four guard, nine Megan Company Grenadier Guards. The Scots Guards quick march, Hill and Laddie. F Company Scots Guards, an incremental company of Scots Guards based in Wellington Barracks. Youngest Guardsman, Guardsman Morrison, turned 18 just a month ago. The Coldstream Guards quick march, Milanolo. And the ensign of number six guard, number seven company Coldstream Guards, is Lieutenant Hugo Bartlott in his first Queen's Birthday Parade. He's following yes. the footsteps of his uncle, grandfather, and great grandfather in military service. Uh, and in number six guard, plenty of family tradition there. We've also got uh, the subaltern, Lieutenant Joss Bucknell. His father is Colonel of the Coldstream, also on parade today. Again, the field officer in brigade waiting salutes the Queen. The mass band's playing the neutral quick march now, Heroes of the Flag. Thomas Bidgood, one of Britain's finest military composers, very popular during the Boer War and the First World War. Well, the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Giles Harris, has a moment to pause now, just a moment before the next stage of the parade. He's been telling us how he's been preparing for today. 
My uncle commanded the battalion in the early 70s, and he commanded this parade, and it's because of him, really, that I joined the battalion. The boys will, you know, they'll prepare, and we'll give orders, and we'll rehearse. And there's always an element of doubt as to whether, you know, we're going to produce the goods. But certainly on operations, when it all starts getting serious, something happens, and the guys just raise their game, you know, pull together and do amazing things, and I've got no doubt that that's what will happen on the praise group. And a nice thing to note watching his grandson lead the parade is Lieutenant Colonel Harris's grandfather, Colonel Donald Easton, MC, late of the Royal West Kent. He's at home, he's organised a special troop party there. We wish him well, of course, we hope he's enjoying the parade. He was awarded the MC in the Battle of Kohima in the Burma campaign of the Second World War. How will Charles be feeling now? Job well done so far, so good. A moment to pause and settle down while the Household Kever and King's Troop have their turn. But we'll just get them back into to line before the mounted troops have their moment. Officers, take post. Quick march. And the colour now taken to the front of the escort, ready for the next stage of this Queen's birthday parade. The foot guards have reformed and it will very soon be the turn of the mounted troops to pass the saluting dais. And you see there the mounted bands of the Household Cavalry moving on to horse guards, led by the director of music, Major Craig Hallett, riding Vain Glory. And the two magnificent drum horses. We've got a new one actually on the left there. That's Adamus for the lifeguards. Only young at Clydesdale. Eight years old, this is his first Queen's Birthday Parade. to four years to train the drum horses. So we've got Mercury, who's very experienced. He's a shy horse. Adamus, as I mentioned, of Clydesdale. Adamus, ridden by musician John Codd, and Mercury by musician Chris Diggle. And now, a hugely dramatic section, the thunder of hooves, the parade ground will be shaking because the King's Troop move on to take their places. It's the 18th year that the King's Troop has been on parade and they join the ceremony at Horse Guards on the request of the Royal Family. 
first took part in 1998. And the duties of the King's Troop include the firing of the Royal Gun salutes on royal anniversaries and state occasions. And this May, they fired a special 41-gun salute from Hyde Park to welcome the new royal arrival, Princess Charlotte. Then motto is ubiqui, as in ubiquitous, meaning everywhere. The motto of the Royal Artillery in recognition of their participation in every theatre of war. surveys the scene and it is a wonderful scene the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery looking magnificent as ever Major Robert Skeggs took command of the King's Troop in August last year and this will be his fourth uh, Queen's Birthday Parade his first as commanding officer the lead gun prominently on display in effect the color of the troop brought it the same reverence as the guards color and these big 13-pound guns, the real thing, by the way, they were used in action in the First World War. Only 25 of these guns uh, in existence today worldwide. And one of them is rumoured to have fired the first round at the Battle of the Somme. changes to the regimental slow march of the lifeguards field officer of the sovereign's escort major warren douglas of the lifeguards his first and last parade as field officer for the queen's birthday parade he leaves the army in june 2016 Standard bearer, the lifeguard squadron corporal major James Fitzgerald. The new standards were presented to the regiments by the Queen last year. The music changes to the Blues and Royals. The regimental slow march. Two divisions of the Blues and Royals. The Seraphile captain is the is Jeremy Sudlow, who's been with the Blues and Royals squadron for 14 months. Horse Mark Doran has spent the last 11 years at the Armoured Regiment, where he completed tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the farriers passed the Queen. See how solidly those drum horses stand. They know what's going on. And now we have the first of the trot tunes. This is Tikar Cardiff, the traditional song of the Red House of Cardiff, one of the most famous dances of the Nangaru tradition from the South and Valleys regions of Wales. It's a cool day, which is good for the horses, but there is quite a breeze out there, so you can get under their tails and just G them up a little bit. But all of them behaving well for the sitting trot. Never the most comfortable of gates as a rider, but everybody looking good. And the 
This is beautifully turned out. 300 hooves will have been oiled this morning, and that riding kit has been stripped and polished for a week. And the saddle today, unchanged since 1904, was designed to be ridden in for days at a time. Commanding officer Major Robert Skeggs is riding Lucy Glitters, who's a very experienced parade horse. Five Queen's Birthday parades under her belt. She's very calm on parade, but um, she can be a bit strong. I'm reliably informed she's got a mouth of iron, which means very insensitive. And the guns of the King's Troop, each pulled by six horses who have their manes hogged, gives the horses a sleek look, but also for practical reasons. It means that harnesses can't snag in it. Today, the tallest officer in the King's Troop, the centre section commander, Captain Nick Watson, is actually riding the smallest charger. She's called Miss Wordsworth. She has a rebellious streak. She's taking an intense dislike to bus stops, apparently. I move on to the Household Cavalry. The last time that horses of the Household Cavalry were used in war was 1940, when the 1st Household Cavalry Regiment deployed uh, to Palestine. The regiment was mechanized in Their birthday tribute, the mounted bands led by Major Craig Hallett there, saluting in their unique way. Kettle drummers crossing their sticks as they pass the saluting platform and the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. It's worth noting that the drummers control the reins with their feet, and that's obviously a remarkable performance by all the musicians considering they have to ride and play, as Claire was underlining earlier. And a splendid sight, members of the mounted bands in their musician state coat, which has remained unchanged since 1685. So very soon the uh, mounted band will come to a halt and the director of music there will signal that he's handing back control to the field officer um, and that will allow everyone to understand that it's time for the final birthday salute to the Queen today. time the guards dress um, all the guards in one long line and remarkable to think it's a precise move it's accomplished without any word of command being given Oh! 
Well, Red Tire, up, oh! Time! At the home, by the vision, right form, great march! Guards getting ready to march off. Closing up to reduce the length of the procession along the Mall. playing Prussia's Glory by Gottfried Piefke. And the pace stick will be returned to the regimental Sun Major, all done by the orderly, Stephen Winnell. Of course, the Queen's Birthday Parade is one of the few occasions when a regimental Sun Major draws his sword on parade. Left guide of the escort, Company Quartermaster Sergeant Doug Bick. We spoke to his wife Nicola at the start of the programme. He joined the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards in 1997. Originally from Blackwood in South Wales. And that's Sir Kai Murray from Prince of Wales oh, Company. Oh. Rugby is a big tradition for us. He's the battalion prop. And making his way to the approach road as we uh, get to the end of this parade, Garrison Sergeant Major, London District, Warrant Officer Class 1, Bill Mott of the Welsh Guards, and his successor, Vernon Stokes, who will take over these considerable duties from tomorrow. This is Bill's final birthday parade. He's been in post for 13 years. He's played a central role in organising some of the biggest state events of the past decade. We'll be talking to him a little later in the programme to mark the end of his remarkable contribution and career in the armed forces. The mighty guards are ready to march off, man. The field officer then saluting Her Majesty asking for permission to march off. And now, again, one of the more difficult parts of the parade, sitting trot with a bearskin is not the most comfortable or easiest drill movement to do. And achieving it well, you think? Absolutely, doing very well indeed. A good combination there of Charles and Winston. So preparations being made for Her Majesty the Queen to process with the guards along the Mall back to Buckingham Palace. And we're all looking forward to the traditional birthday flight past by the Royal Air Force a little later on. The Ascot Landau, the 19th century carriage being brought back to the saluting base. And in these closing moments of the parade here at Horse Guards, Richard, it's worth 
you telling us and letting us in on a few secrets about the moment at which the commanding officer becomes aware of the royal verdict on what's gone on. There is only one judge of how this parade has gone, and that's Her Majesty. After the parade, I'm sure Her Majesty will have a chat to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Giles, Charles Harris and let him know how it's gone. But uh, from a layman's perspective, from where I'm sitting, it's a, done an ex exceptional job, and I'm sure Her Majesty will be pleased with the way it's gone this year in our centenary year for the Welsh Guards. First uh, carriage procession. The guests who were in the Horse Guards building, Duchess of Cambridge, Prince Harry, Duchess of Cornwall, already on their way back to Buckingham Palace. They too will be looking forward to the uh, flight past by the Royal Air Force. They'll all be appearing on that famous balcony. Prince Harry there turning 31 in September this year and spent four weeks in April and May seconded to the Australian Defence Force and he then went on an eight-day tour of New Zealand. Um, and while he was there, he reflected on his time in the armed forces. It's worth just uh, sharing those words. He said, I've had an epic 10 years, I've had great fun. The army keep giving me great jobs, and I can never thank them enough for that. Prince Harry's words. Mass bands signaling that the Queen is ready to leave. Some of the best tunes have been saved for the march off and the procession along the Mall. and those who know their Welsh tunes will spot lots of them. This medley is called Men of Wales, composed by Archie Ellis, who served in the Welsh Guards Band, well, nearly a century ago in those very early days. And it's based on the regimental bugle call of the Welsh Guards, and it includes some of the best-known Welsh tunes. There we have the unique honour for the Field Officer Brigade waiting taking position just behind the Colonel, Prince of Wales, just behind the Majesty's coach. It's a good moment to mention two members of the mass bands appearing in their last parade today. In among the musicians there, senior band Sergeant Major Andrew Wood of the Grenadier Guards, uh, he's on the far right of the front rank of trombones, uh, just out of frame there. Um, he's responsible for much of the organisation of the mass bands, we wish him well. And Sergeant Penny in the Grenadier Guards Band, he served in no fewer than 21 Queen's Birthday Parades, both records to be proud of. I suppose the main emotion now for those involved in the organisation, which it is relief, frankly. Yes, there'll be a sense of relief when they march down the Mall and also a sense of pride for a job well done. And if one can relax a bit when marching, there'll be a sense of pride going down the Mall after this parade. Very enthusiastic applause from the thousands of people in the stands here on Horse Guards Parade. As the Queen makes her way towards the Mall. Queen has attended this parade more than any other monarch and uh, taken the salute at every Queen's birthday parade since her accession to the throne 63 years ago, except in 1955 when the parade was cancelled. It was because of some industrial action, but uh, apart from that, she's been here faithfully every year. First appearance, by the way, at the birthday parade for the Queen was as a little girl, watching her grandfather, George V, take the salute. And she first took part in the parade in 1947, at the age of 21, riding as Colonel Grenadier Guards um, behind her father, King George VI. Uh, it was the first parade in that, that one in 47 uh, to be held after the Second World War.
So it's a route that the Queen knows very, very well. In 1951, at the age of 25, as Princess Elizabeth, she took the salute for the first time because of her father's ill health. And that, by the way, was the first time that uh, Prince Charles attended, riding in his grandmother's carriage as a little boy. The Queen, of course, as Sovereign and Colonel-in-Chief, took the salute for the first time in 1952. The rousing tune of Sospenbach, which I know rather well and which I'm rather biased about, given that it's my home turf. I'm wondering, Richard, about your verdict on the parade. Um, some viewers tell me that, well, you guys are always very loyal. You'll always say it's good. Um, what's your honest view on how it's gone? We are always very loyal. That's why we joined the Welsh Guards. Well said. <laughs> but no, it, I do think it has gone well. A lot of pressure on people out there, particularly on the ensign. A young officer recently joined, and he's done a cracking job, as have all of them. But in particular, I'd, I'd pick out the man of the match, uh, Ed Clark. There, done very well. We mentioned the Queen's eye for detail, but let's not forget the Duke's eye for detail too. Absolutely, uh, I do remember on, on one of the troops there was a, uh, a guardsman tucked away in the rear ranks, and. Uh, his Royal Highness did point out that uh, he was rather large. But again, I did point out that actually he was another of the battalion props and he forgave us for that one. Well, this great tradition of the monarch uh, leading the guards back to Buckingham Palace was established by George V back in 1914. And uh, the parade at that time had become increasingly popular, so it was decided to provide a, a much more impressive an even more impressive spectacle for the thousands of spectators. And we are staying on air here on BBC One to see the procession back to Buckingham Palace all along the way and to see that fly past by the Royal Air Force, which the uh, Queen and members of the Royal Family will be enjoying. Um, and the, the Mall, of course, the great setting for so many of these big ceremonial events. And, uh, Queen and the Duke have so many good memories of major events along the Mall and back to Buckingham Palace. So as we look forward to the events leading to the balcony appearance, we welcome once again this year to join me and uh, Richard. We're joined by the author and journalist and commentator Robert Hardman, who writes for the Daily Mail. Robert, thanks very much for coming in. And your thoughts on today's parade first? Well, it's uh, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, I think a, a, another a great birthday parade for the Queen, but what a, what a great week for uh, Welsh military pageantry. Uh, the, earlier this week, of course, the Queen was down in Cardiff at the Millennium Stadium to, uh, to present uh, colours to the Royal Welsh Regiment there, and, and now to be here today uh, with the Welsh Guards. And, and also this week, let's not forget, she was also there at that splendid pageant at the Royal Hospital Chelsea to mark... 200 years of the Gurkhas as well. So this really comes at the end of a of a pretty remarkable week for uh, for, for the military and for for great royal pageantry. Well, you mentioned a good week for the military. We were talking there about the remarkable contribution of the Garrison Sergeant Major London District, Bill Mott. He's going to be a hard act to follow, isn't he? Oh, he is. I mean, he's been at the centre of every major royal occasion, state occasion, uh, royal weddings, the Diamond Jubilee. I mean, really, no royal event is complete without uh, the eagle eye of, uh, of Garrison Sergeant Major Bill Mott. Uh, as we saw him on parade earlier there, he's proudly sporting his OBE. He's a freeman of the City of London. Uh, I, I'm not a military man but I, I know those who are say he's one of the most revered, respected and dare one say feared men uh, in the British Army. He's a fantastic guy. He's one of three brothers, uh, all of whom served in the Welsh Guards. And I think uh, we'll talk to the eldest, uh, wrong, the middle brother, Nick Mott, later on. All of them reached the rank of W1. Uh, Nick Mott has gone on to reach the highest rank that they can reach, having been joined as a guardsman. He's now a lieutenant colonel, and I've had the... the real pleasure of serving with all three of them and uh, owe them a lot. A word about the regimental adjutants at this point. We often don't get a, an opportunity to mention them, but what is their significance, Richard? They're a really important group of uh, officers. They're, they're retired officers who are employed to help look after the spirit and ethos uh, of the regiment uh, and key people. And I must just mention, just going out of shot 
Field Marshal Lord Guthrie of Craigiebank, Colonel of the Life Guards. Just to confuse viewers, he's actually a Welsh Guardsman. Uh, joined the Welsh Guards in 1959 and was adjutant of the battalion for our 50th anniversary. So very nice that he's uh, been able to be on parade today. He's done the 50th and the centenary and served for the majority of the life of the regiment. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, at the end of day, today's parade, uh, we're going to see uh, Garrison Sergeant Major Bill Mott. Um, I'm sure he'll be uh, invited inside uh, Buckingham Palace there to, uh, to, to, to say farewell because he has uh, played such a remarkable role. Good question to ask at this point. What does the future hold for Bill Mott? Because uh, the man who's left his mark on some of the biggest ceremonial events of the past decade, as we say, is going into retirement. He likes to make his voice heard on the parade ground. I have to say, he's been rather less keen on speaking in public, um, but he did kindly agree to talk to us about his role. You've been Garrison Sergeant Major for 13 years. Those people watching who are, you know, not immersed in the life of the armed services, how would you describe your job to them? How would you explain what you do? I I'm Mystique and I organise all of the ceremony around any of these great parades that we get involved in, state parades. There's two main areas. There's the annual event that's tried and tested and has a written instruction, but we then have the, the ad hoc. It might be the event such as the Victory in Europe or the Anzac Gallipoli. And they're, they're one-offs that just need to be coordinated and controlled. So an event on the scale of the Diamond Jubilee, for example. You're smiling already. What, what does that entail? So the Diamond Jubilee, we, we have to construct it, we have to coordinate it, we have to put it into being in the same manner that we would any great state level occasion. As I walked down the route from Westminster Abbey, I got to Admiralty Arch and I looked down towards uh, Buckingham Palace and that redness, which is my favourite colour anyway because of a certain football team yeah. allegiance and yeah, childhood and all that. <laughs> but looking down the mall and seeing that was that moment that I'll never be able to replicate. I'll never be able to experience that sort of thing again. A, a great moment, wonderful. You're known as a very determined man full of passion. How would you describe the things that fire you? What drives Bill Mott? That sense of loyalty, camaraderie, respect, uh, my allegiance to this great country of ours, to our sovereign, um, but also to my comrades and wanting to achieve the best for us. I mean, I love the Household Division and I've always loved it. I've always loved being a guardsman. Uh, so my self-discipline has always helped me. And so I've embedded that into every parade that I've been involved in to, to try and achieve the best for the division, um, for the sovereign, and, and obviously for the nation. Three cheers for Her Majesty the Queen! Pepe! You served in the Falklands in 1982. What was your experience there? What we experienced in, in the Falklands was a great um, learning curve for me in prioritising life in the right way. I can look back to 1982 and the Sir Galahad, which was a life-threatening situation. And what it essentially did, it, it made me reprioritise life to get things in, in the right order. And I think that actually helped me. It made me look at where I was and think, hey, Bill, this is a good life. This is something that is to be cherished and nurtured. What is the most challenging thing you've had to undertake over the last 13 years? Without doubt, repatriations. I, I had in my mind right from an early stage because of the likes of Sir Galahad and all the friends that I lost as a young man, it was paramount in my mind that we were going to do this job well. 
and it wasn't just going to be a, a straightforward arrival extraction. And I, I wasn't going to cut corners. It was going to be done properly, and it still is. What does the future hold for Billmott? Kentucky, with my wife Tammy. Are you really going to find enough things to interest you in Kentucky after what you've been doing here for the last 13 years? I haven't got a clue. My wife, Tammy, has suggested that I get a, a herd of cattle and start forming them up and having them doing left forms and guard mounts. Flick, Matt! The wonderful thing about it, Hugh, is the fact that after all them wonderful years that I've had in the Welsh Guards, I've now got something really exciting to look forward to. Bill, we want to wish you well, and above all, lots of good health and happiness in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. The one and only Bill Mott, Garrison Sergeant Major. Uh, his last day in his formal role today. And of course we wish him well. And I think it's fair to say, Richard and Robert, um, we're going to miss him rather badly at these things. We are indeed. He's a hard act to follow. However, being the Household Division, there's a few more waiting in the wings. I'm sure that Sergeant Major Stokes will be equally impressive and we look forward to seeing his mark on state ceremonial for the future. He, he's already made his presence felt and uh, I think you're absolutely right. And Robert really just underlines for everyone watching how important these rules are in ensuring that these kinds of events run smoothly and properly and in a polished way. Uh, absolutely. I mean, he, what we've seen, uh, those, those words I thought were very touching actually. I think they go a long way to explain why he's so popular across the armed forces, but also with all members of the royal family there. They all know who Garrison and Sergeant Major Bill Mott is and they'll all miss him a lot as well. So a word of explanation here, um, Richard, for, for viewers who are maybe not so familiar with the form of the day. The parade on horse guards clearly is over, but we now have an extra stage at Buckingham Palace. So why don't you explain what's going on here? Yes, there's another march past Her Majesty outside Buckingham Palace. You just saw a shot of her there standing on the dais. And the guards will march past once more when the foot guards will go into Wellington Barracks. I feel like that's a more private salute to Her Majesty uh, to say um, parade over and uh, off back to Wellington Barracks now. And what happens after that? The Queen then leaves this, um, the dais, leaves the saluting base and goes back into the palace with the Duke. What's the course of events after that? The guard will then uh, go back to Wellington Barracks, apart from the escort. The escort, of course, will will mount guard. So having done the parade on Horse Guards Parade, they will then take the responsibility for guarding Her Majesty at Buckingham Palace and uh, at St James' Palace as well, so not only for them. Very nice to see there the Duchess of Cambridge for the first time uh, since uh, the birth of Princess Charlotte back in May. And uh, this, of course, is always uh, the one time of the year when we see the whole the extended royal family together in public. Um, uh, we, they're not all up there yet, because obviously some are making their way back from horse guards, uh, but a little later on uh, we'll see them all coming out for that fly past. There is a formal moment, um, again to do with the Garrison Sergeant Major, before his final farewell, because uh, a big day, of course, for the entire Mott family, um, but it's the last time that he'll be saluting Her Majesty, and he'll be watched keenly by uh, Prince Harry and the other members of the royal family. It's the last time that he'll salute Her Majesty in his capacity as Garrison Sergeant Major, um, a post he's uh, held since 2002, and this is his 13th birthday parade. Very poignant moment for him, but a proud one too, and he can be very pleased with what he's achieved. Absolutely he can, and I was lucky enough to have a very brief chat to him this morning. I know it's an emotional day for him, and it'll be a fond farewell, uh, and I know he'll miss it. There he is, saluting the Majesty for his last time as Garrison Sergeant Major. What a moment it is for Garrison Sergeant Major Mott. We wish him all the best. I think I detected a rather broad smile there on the Queen's face as Bill Mott passed. I think you did, Hugh, absolutely. I think it's just uh, making, having a little word about it too there with the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, they will miss him. Well, the crowds have gathered, as they always do, and uh, I must say it's a little brighter than it was uh, earlier, so the conditions are much better and rather pleasant for people to be out uh, seeing this stage of the Queen's Birthday Parade. You can just see the 13,000 geraniums they've planted there to match the Guardsmen's tunics. Duke of 
York there talking to the Duchess of Cambridge. Duchess of Cornwall next to her. They're waiting to be joined by the Queen. So the march past at Buckingham Palace is underway. And it's a good moment, uh, Richard, for me to ask you, given your unique experience of commanding the parade on two occasions, how curious was that for you? And uh, were you in a position the second time round to, to learn some lessons from the first? Yes, I think I was. It was a very odd uh, occasion that I commanded on the first time. So I was commanding a Coldstream troop and uh, actually was given relatively little notice for that. I was actually on operations in Bosnia at the time. And I'd never ridden before and never done the, the parade, so that was all a bit of a shock. But uh, it was a great honour to command the, the Coldstream Guards, and then uh, to do it again with my own battalion, the Welsh Guards, was a, was a real privilege. So the crowd's enjoying the exacting standards that are set at these ceremonial events every year. And I think, Robert, it's worth underlining as well that 2015 is turning out to be a remarkably busy year, not just on the ceremonial side, but for the royal family, including the Queen. Yes, but as, you, as you mentioned earlier, we've got that uh, remarkable uh, milestone later in the summer when she will actually overtake uh, Queen Victoria to become our longest reigning monarch. But um, it's an extraordinary year for anniversaries just next week. Queen is going to be marking on Monday at Runnymede the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. Later in the week, as you mentioned earlier, the Prince of Wales will be out in Belgium and then back at St Paul's to mark the uh, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. But let's not forget, we've got the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Britain coming up a little later on. In the autumn, we've got the 600th anniversary of the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, it's, it's a very busy year for, uh, for historians, but these are all important landmarks. And as ever, the royal family is at the heart of these uh, celebrations and commemorations. Uh, uh, and of course, next week as well, uh, as soon as uh, the Queen Mead of Runnymede for the, uh, the Magna Carta celebrations, that uh, then she returns to Windsor Castle for the uh, annual gathering of the Order of the Garter, the Garter Knights, and that procession that always precedes Royal Ascot. So it is a very, very busy week in prospect. There'll be people watching wondering what was the sense of saying two or three years ago, I think at the Diamond Jubilee, that the Queen would be slowing down a little and taking a little <laughs> more time. This 2015 doesn't sound like that. Yeah, I think I think someone pressed a pause button on that plan because uh, later on this month, for example, we've got the Queen going on a, on a very significant state visit to Germany. Um, uh, German, the German government are extremely excited about it and the whole of Berlin is going to be turning out to welcome her there. She's got a very, very uh, important day in Frankfurt where they're estimating tens if not hundreds of thousands of people are going to be there. Uh, later in the year, we've got a, the gathering of all the Commonwealth nations in Malta, um, the, the so-called Chogham Summit. Uh, she's going to be at that. Uh, so for the Queen, it's, it's really uh, not no different from, uh, from previous years when one looks at her e extremely busy diary. Uh, a diary shared too in terms of busyness with the Prince of Wales. Yes, well the Prince of Wales who we just see there um, on, on, as Colonel of the Welsh Guards just behind the Queen there, he has been uh, very, very uh, involved. Um, he's, for him this year he's already been on uh, eight overseas tours. Uh, we see him doing a lot of uh, a lot of the the day-to-day -day stuff of monarchy, do you like investitures, audiences, that sort of thing. Uh, he's, he's, he's taken on a, a great number of uh, the Queen's duties as well. Queen is now leaving to go into Buckingham Palace, ready for the final royal salute.
so the Queen and the Duke make their way back into Buckingham Palace and the royal family leave the balcony just for a moment but they will be back very shortly uh, when the fly past takes place that's something that they enjoy and we all enjoy um, but we were mentioning there that it's a big day for the Mott family and we've already heard from Bill Mott but let's join Claire again with another of the family yeah, because Bill's brother, Lieutenant Colonel Nick Mott, is with me. A huge day for the family, and so many of you have served in the Welsh Guards. Why is that? Uh, I, I think it came natural, Claire, to be honest with you. We, we come from a military background, uh, grandparents, mother and father, uncles and aunties. I think it was natural for Billy to br uh, follow three cousins who also served in the Welsh Guards as three brothers. It was natural then for Billy to join, and for myself and my younger brother, Jonathan, to follow suit. You must have shared some very special moments together, as well as some difficult ones, obviously. Absolutely, Claire, you know, both operationally and non-operationally. In the younger days, me and Bill served in the Falcons together, which brought challenging uh, circumstances. And then some nicer and, and better uh, challenges uh, faced us in the later years. And at one stage, the three of us were actually together on the troop in the colour, where Billy was actually the drill sergeant of the battalion, uh, as we've seen today. And I was the, the, the right guy, the number two guard, and Jonathan, the younger brother, was actually the colour son of the colour party. And looking at you all together there, I mean, a wonderful family tradition, but you're going to miss Bill, aren't you? Absolutely, but I don't think he'd be too far away. I'm sure, you know, in, in, in today's technology, I'm sure Bill will keep a tab on all of us. And it sounded like he was going to be teaching the cows how to parade and drill. Apparently. I'm <laughs> sure if he can sort out you know, the British Armed Forces, I'm sure he can take those talents overseas and, you know, and work his wonders. Well, we wish him a very happy retirement in America and, and all of you many happy family celebrations to come. Very, very proud day for the Mott family. Claire, thanks very much. And uh, there you have the crowds making their way down the mall towards Buckingham Palace. Um, they're in good time. Uh, in 15, 20 minutes or so, we'll uh, we'll have the fly past, which is normally absolutely on the dot. So we're looking forward to that. And I suppose I should say that although I'd like the day to be all about Wales, Robert, it's not all about <laughs> Wales, is it? <laughs> well, it's it's all about the United Kingdom, Hugh. Um, uh, we'll see people, for, in fact, people from all over the world in that crowd there now making their way down to the Mall. But um, yes, in the next few weeks, um, the royal family have a lot of engagements all over the country, but particularly in Scotland. The Queen, of course, will be taking up residence at the Palace of Holyrood House for the traditional week of, of events there and the Prince of Wales himself as well he's got a busy week in prospect uh, in, in Scotland he, he will be spending another week uh, in, in Wales doing uh, events there and, and in his capacity as Duke of Cornwall he's got a big tour of, uh, of Devon and Cornwall I shouldn't say tour he actually uh, that's that's where he, he, he his, his spiritual home is so he'll be he'll be undertaking a lot of events there so uh, th there's a lot coming up um, next week the Princess Royal who we've uh, seen a lot today she's on her way to the Royal Highland Show. So, um, as ever, summer is is full of royal engagements right across the country. Important to mention, as we see the Metropolitan Police doing the the work efficiently today. Um, they, of course, are responsible for the smooth running of lots of aspects of today's parade. Uh, I'm going to mention PC Richard Watson because he served for 30 years in the Met. Today's his last day, and he's been involved in uh, Trooping the Colour for the past 12 years, and he's been the main planner for for three of those years. So um, good to wish Richard well and to thank him for his contributions. We were talking earlier about the appearance on that famous balcony, which will take place shortly. And I know that lots of viewers, Robert, will be asking, are they likely to see a certain young person on the balcony in the shape of uh, Prince George? Uh, well, wouldn't that be nice, Hugh? Um, I mean, it's, it's, far too, uh, it's far too soon to say, really, when he's going to start making appearances in public. Um, it's fair to say Prince William first appeared on the balcony when he was two. Uh, Prince Harry was quite a bit younger. He was just nine months old when he, um, when he came out of his first birthday parade. But um, uh, we know that the, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, you know, they like to keep their children um, uh, well out of the public gaze. So uh, it may be decided that today's the day uh, when, uh, when, when, when Prince George should see the this, uh, this balcony that is going to feature very prominently in his life, but we will, of course, be seeing uh, that 
the, the, the Cambridges and their, and their children ne just next month at the christening of Princess Charlotte. But uh, like everyone else, like all the people in that crowd, I'm sure if Prince George does decide to make his first balcony appearance today, uh, they'll and we will all be very pleased to see it. We shall see. Uh, Robert, thanks very much. You mentioned earlier, too, a part of the busy year, the commemorations of the Battle of Waterloo 200 years ago, the familiar bearskins that we saw on horse guards, so much in evidence today, they, of course, are reminders of the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, that epic confrontation between Wellington and Napoleon. Well, we've been to Belgium to discover how the search to reveal the battleground's past can help today's soldiers come to terms with their experiences. The Battle of Waterloo is particularly important to the Household Division. Uh, we had the Scots Guards, the Grandier Guards and the Coldstream Guards alongside both regiments of the Household Cavalry fought here. Waterloo's in Belgium. We're about 20 miles south of Brussels and Wellington deliberately picked this ground because it blocked the French advance on Brussels. It blocks the road. There's no escaping that we're looking at two huge egos on this battlefield, Wellington and Napoleon. And so when they come together here in June of 1815 and meet at Waterloo, it's obviously going to be a fairly big match. Veterans doing archaeology has been something that's been running for a few years now. It's been proven to help those injured soldiers with their recovery, um, particularly useful with people with post-traumatic stress. I saw uh, conflict in the Fort Gulf War 91, also the two tours of Ireland 92 and 93. I suffer from horrendous nightmares every night, so I wake up cold sweats, panicky, soaking with sweat, and it's just, it's one of the things I've got to learn to live with. Being in a trench with a trowel for an afternoon might give you a few seconds, a few minutes, even a few hours of a uh, respite from the, the hell that's going on inside. Here are some of the, the metal finds that we've been making with the metal detector survey. You can see that we've got there a British brown bass musket ball and we can tell that because of the dimensions it's 0.75 caliber and the great thing for us is that the French caliber is slightly smaller. You can feel the weight of those, they're just yeah, solid lead, they're, yeah, not, yeah, they're, they're not like the modern yeah, bullets that you yeah, use. Yeah. The stopping power in those is, is something to behold. It's a privilege just to, to stand on such a major um, battleground, really, for the Scots Guards. And a lot of brave men died here defending this, this farm. When I first got back from Afghanistan, it's still very much in your mind. And it, it makes you, it, it does, it does get to you sometimes when you think about it. Two light companies of the Grenadiers were sent into the farm on the day of the battle. You were taken off to join your regiment on the hill and there you fought off Napoleon's old guard, his Imperial Guard, his elite troops. And because of that fight and your victory in it, you got called the Grenadiers as a point of honour, and you also got to wear those big bearskins, because that's what the French Imperial Guard were wearing. You're talking tens of thousands of men on both sides, having to walk over dead bodies everywhere, and it's just like, it must have been a bloodbath, and, you know, having to crack on with the battle when they've got so, many, so much dead around you. trying to think of it being outnumbered like two to one, three to one, and just repelling the French over and over again. Just fighting not for your country, you're fighting for the man next to you. I did a tour in 2014 of Afghanistan um, where I was injured and I've lost use of my left wrist and hand. Sean, this is probably the most famous 10 square feet of ground in your regiment's history. What do you know about the closing of these gates? Basically, um, we had Corporal Graham who closed the gates uh, to the farm when the French tried to invade and 
push into the farm. So with the bravery of Corporal Graham and the other Coldstream guards at the time who shut the gate and sealed it, um, Save the day, really. Exactly, and and Wellington essentially said afterwards at the closing of the gates of Hougoumont, save the battle for for the Allies. So uh, most, I would agree with that. Very <laughs> well, you would <laughs> being a cold stream. The archaeology does it, it. It takes my mind away from the things that caused me the problems in the first place. So it doesn't allow any of the traumatic experiences to enter into my head so I then don't like, suffer from any panic or anxiety attacks. One of the things is key to remember that we're, we're not trying to change people's lives with one week of archaeology. But what we're trying to do is provide them with a positive experience and something that they can take home and maybe motivate them in whatever they choose to go and do. And at the end of every day, whether you've dug a hole or scraped back a bit of earth, You've achieved something, you've done something, and that's just a great feeling for people to, people to have. And you see that on people's faces at the end of every day. So interesting to see the work that Waterloo Uncovered are doing in Belgium. And joining me here with our backdrop of Buckingham Palace is Dr Graham Jones. You can tell us about the commemorations happening here in London next weekend. Claire, good afternoon. What a wonderful day, by the way. Absolutely marvellous. Next weekend, my focus is shifting to the Waterloo Parade, which is going to take place here in the park. It starts, actually, in Belgium with bringing over the post-chase and reenactment of everything into London. The culmination of all the commemorations of Waterloo are going to be here. We've got 11 international military bands parading here. It's going to start at 4.30 in the afternoon on the Sunday, and that's all to do with kind of creating the atmosphere of a gathering of army onto Horse Guards Parade. <sighs> oh, very good stuff. And... Also, once those gathered armies are onto Horse Guards Parade, at 1815, that's quarter past six, at 1815 we're going to step off and we've got 500 children who've been busy bees putting together papier-mâché heads of history and they're going to have Napoleon's heads, Wellington's heads, we're going to have even horses' heads and they're going to be parading alongside the military bands to create the most incredible, colourful parade that has been seen other than, of course, Trooping the Colour. I can tell from your energy and your enthusiasm that you are going to engage them fully and you're really looking forward to this. Do you know something? It has been in the planning now for five years and this has become my life over the last month or so. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm so looking forward to seeing we've got the French artillery band, we've got the Polish army band, the Finnish navy band, the Dutch army band and all these bands are coming into town just to take part in this moment and to see this pan-European organisation, the idea that is Europe is all going to be seen culminating in this massive commemoration of the Battle of Waterloo here in the Royal Park. And I know that people watching today, they're obviously watching because they're keen on pageantry and they would love to see this. If they want to be here in person, do they need to buy tickets or is it just rock up and get a position? This is rock up and get a position. And I would say to everybody there, get there early because it's going to be very busy in the park with things happening from 4.30, concerts at all various different places in the park, bands marching in all directions. The whole area, by the way, is closed off to transport. So it's all, everybody can walk anywhere. We're going to have a really great great fun afternoon but commemorating the Battle of Waterloo. It sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for telling us about it, Dr. Graham My pleasure, Jones. Claire. My pleasure indeed. Thank you. Dr. Graham Jones, full of enthusiasm. We're looking forward to those plans being realized. But look at this site because that's a bigger crowd as we've seen in many years, I think, Robert, isn't it? It's a, it's a huge crowd making its way down the mall. It, 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 it never fails to, uh, to impress the sight of the, 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 the thousands, tens of thousands coming down uh, the mall for this moment. But uh, it is you know, that great moment of the year when you do see all the royal family together in public. They're, they're all here. Actually, sadly, uh, the Earl and Countess West aren't here today because they're attending a, a royal wedding in Sweden. But you've got all the senior members of the family here. And, uh, many people come year after year, and not just from Britain. I, I, I once met a gentleman who comes from Australia every year just to see this moment. It's a great sight. Let's go over to Green Park, shall we, because uh, the King's Troop are about to move into Green Park in their rousing way for that 41-gun salute, which is a traditional part of the Queen's official birthday. It's just uh, a stone's throw away from Buckingham Palace. 
And then after we have the King's Troops contribution, the entire royal family, with one or two exceptions, as Robert has noted, will appear on that balcony ready for the fly past. I'm told, by the way, I should uh, give you a little bit of a warning, that because of the rather iffy weather today um, in the skies above London and the southeast of England, uh, it will not be um, as extensive a fly past as we've seen in previous years, but we will see the red arrows, so uh, there is to be a, a very big highlight to the fly past, but it won't be as extensive as some we've seen in the past. Seen in Green Park, King's Troop ready to make their dramatic entrance, and they'll be firing that 41 gun salute. It's a 21 gun salute, by the way, for the Queen's official birthday, but they'll be firing an additional 20 gun salute because it is taking pl place in a royal park, and uh, Green Park, of course, is, uh, is one of the royal parks. So that'll be taking place. Um, just a few seconds and uh, there was a gun salute just a few days ago as well to mark the Duke of Edinburgh's 94th birthday. Well since the Queen's birthday parade last year the King's Troop has welcomed a new adjutant and she's with Claire. Yeah, Claire's held that role since, is it July? Of yes, now? yes, absolutely, Claire. So um, I, I was new in post with the commanding officer and we had uh, about six weeks to prepare for the Invictus Games opening ceremony, which was which was great to do. Uh, it's really fun. So that was your sort of first event and I would imagine you've been pretty busy over the last 11 months. Absolutely. So ceremonial season has been rolling on, uh, but note, uh, points to note, so the uh, biggest parade we've done recently was for Princess uh, Charlotte and that was a wonderful galloping salute, 41 rounds in Hyde Park. And is it a difficult thing to organise? Do conditions make a difference to the behaviour of the horses? Absolutely. It's slightly windy today, so um, so we try and take the horses out for a nice ride, uh, and we get their backs down, sort of a military trays, uh, get get them exercised for an hour before we go out onto parade, and that just calms their nerves, and it also settles the soldiers as well. An awful lot of women um, join the King's Troop. Why is it so welcoming to women, and what would your sort of ratio be now, men to women? Uh, we're nearly at 50%, which is wonderful, uh, and we're, we're also at 50% for the officers as well, which is great. Um, I think the gunners as a whole is very attractive. Uh, we have lots of different sort of niche uh, business that we can do, and it's really nice that soldiers want to come to London. It's a job that they can't do in any other regiment, so that's, I think, why the King's Troop is so attractive to them. And you're very settled now in your relatively new barracks in, in Woolwich. I came there a couple of years ago, and it, and it seems very good um, facilities. It is. It's quite remarkable, yeah. Uh, facilities for soldiers and horses alike is just wonderful. Uh, maybe just a little bit too far east, but absolutely wonderful out there. Yeah, it's really great. And what will you be up to over the summer? Do the horses get a rest at all? Yeah, we're planning our summer summer training camps at the moment, uh, and it's just a nice week for the soldiers to have a nice relaxing time. If possible, we go and do some training, low-level training, cross-country, and, and just some, some time to enjoy themselves, and we turn the horses out to grass too. Brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing them with the, with the gun salute coming very shortly, Claire. Thank Thanks you so very much. much, Claire. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> So the King's Troop in place in uh, Green Park and just three months to go at this stage before the Queen uh, is set to break that remarkable record of her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, as the longest reigning monarch in British history at uh, 63 years and seven months. Number one! many of my ancestors, a noble motto, I serve. Our Queen starts on her journey from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey, there to be crowned Queen Elizabeth II. wearing the Order of the Garter and looks both regal and military and elegant all at once. And the cry 
cheers ring out. We want the Queen. marking that wonderful history. Uh, I'm joined by in pensioner Ray Huggins. Once a Grenadier Guard, always a Grenadier Guard, so Thank of you, the Grenadier Guards. Tell me about the first birthday parade that you took part in. Uh, the first, 1947, uh, we, we were back from Germany in 1947. It was the King's <laughs> birthday parade then, of course, uh, and we were in Kharki. I, I, I seem to remember the first time that ceremonial dress was brought in was when Her Majesty got married in, in November the, and the Household Cavalry, but we were still, I was a member of the Guard of Honour at, at Westminster Abbey. Funnily enough, I was the shortest man on play. I was <laughs> number 96, I was the shortest man on play. But you're not a short man. Well, uh, I was for the, for the King's, as it was then the King's Company, the minimum height was six foot two and a half, the oh, minimum gosh. height. Oh, right. I mean, six foot seven was average, I think. And uh, they couldn't find 96. I was, I was moved into the 96 position, which was superb, of course, lovely. And then, funnily enough, I, I, I've been thinking about this uh, while I was sat down listening, that um, I think I've done more Queen's birthday parades abroad than I have in this country. First one was in Tripoli, I think in 19... 49 or 50, I can't remember. We did one in Tripoli when we left Palestine. Now, I did one in Berlin, Dusseldorf, West Africa, the Cameroon, <laughs> South America. Fun, all fantastic, all wonderful. I mean, Her Majesty, the greatest expert on ceremonial in the world, without any shadow of a doubt. Be wonderful person, absolutely perfect in the gym, absolutely perfect. Absolutely. Well, it's wonderful to have you here today, and I know that actually you've you've met the Queen, haven't you, at the Diamond Jubilee? Yes, um, I've been privileged. The regiment presented Her Majesty with a, a, a Diamond Jubilee present, and there were 20 people invited to lunch, and I was one of them. Yeah. Was wonderful. My, Her Majesty and Prince Philip were there. It was great. Yeah, she's a wonderful lady. Wonderful lady. How she remembers all this, I don't know. When we did the Guard of Honour for the river trip, you know, because it was at Chelsea Harbour, and we did the Guard of Honour, the pensioners. Uh, should, I, should I say this? The, the, the agent said, Your Majesty, this is Mr Huggins. He, I was the Academy Sergeant Major Sanders. And the Majesty looked at him and said, I know Mr Huggins was the Academy Sergeant Major Sanders. We had lunch together the last month. <laughs> Fantastic stuff, Ray. Thank you so much for joining My us. My pleasure, ma'am. Thank you very much, Andrew. My pleasure. Thank you. Lovely reminiscences there, and uh, very nice twinkle in the eye and enjoying the day. And as we now we're within just a few minutes of the uh, appearance on the balcony and the fly past, and uh, I suppose, uh, Richard, I'd ask you what is going on in the palace at this moment? Because, of course, in your capacity in the past as commanding officer, uh, you've been part of that reception. So, what's the kind of atmosphere there right now? I couldn't possibly comment on things that go on behind the scenes. However, I think uh, we might expect that the horses might have been given a carrot or two uh, after the parade and uh, there might be a conversation or two about how the uh, parade might have gone. What are we looking forward to then, Robert? Well, I think to see all the royal family out there and, uh, and, and just to see the response of the crowd. Every, every year there is a, the most uh, warmest of receptions uh, for all of them. Uh, I think very nice to see the Duchess of Cambridge uh, back in public for the first time um, since the birth of uh, Princess Charlotte. And also uh, very nice to see uh, just to see the, the, the Duke of Edinburgh, actually, he just celebrated his 94th birthday. Um, he's been very much at the heart of today's parade. 
Um, we, we talked earlier about people taking things easier. Ah, oh, here they come now. Here's the Queen. She's going to lead out some of the, uh, the younger members of the family. There's the Duke of Edinburgh um, just behind her. Listen to the roar. A great roar from the crowd outside Buckingham Palace. Prince of Wales. And look at the Duke of Cambridge. Let's go back to the balcony and have a look at... William, because this is a significant moment, uh, isn't it, Robert? Ah, uh, here we go. There he is. His first appearance on the palace balcony that he's going to know so well. Uh, short, shortly before his second birthday, there is Prince George. And what we see there is... Uh, it, it is a historic moment, genuinely historic moment, Hugh. It's the first time we've seen four generations of the royal family on the palace balcony since uh, the days of the late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. But it's the first time we've seen... Uh, a sovereign and three future sovereigns together in public ever, I think. We saw that famous christening photo, of course, of Prince George's christening. There was a famous... Uh, that was a, a, a great moment. This is the first time in public we've seen the Queen and uh, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge and Prince George next to each other. That, that is a, a historic image. There was a, an audible roar when uh, George came into view and uh, William stepped forward. But he does seem to be taking great interest in what he sees. He certainly does. He's, he seems to be perfecting the wave. He's just clocking the crowds. Um, be interesting to see how he reacts to uh, to the RAF fly past. Uh, uh, he's obviously knows all about helicopters. I'm sure he's got one or two at home. Uh, but I think uh, that definitely is a bonus for the crowds who are here today. I don't think anyone or well, nobody knew that was going to happen. But as I said, it's the first time in public we've seen. Uh, a monarch and three future monarchs alongside each other. Quite a moment. Well, they're expecting, and the Duke of Edinburgh there is uh, looking up into the skies. Very cloudy, I have to say. Uh, rather grey skies in London today. We were expecting eight elements of this traditional birthday fly past, but that's been uh, reduced to a couple because we're going to see the helicopter uh, element, uh, the support helicopter force, and then we'll have the Red Arrows. So there will be quite a spectacular finale to the fly past itself for the Red Arrows are here. But uh, the, the Dakota from the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, sadly, because of conditions, not able to fly. The Spitfires, the two Hurricanes, and then we had some other more modern craft too. So they've taken out quite a few of the elements because of the, uh, the conditions, which have not been favorable. Uh, and they were telling us just a short while ago, it's uh, a decision not taken lightly, um, uh, but uh, there are strict rules in place governing fly pass uh, over London, especially for some of these older planes. And for that reason, uh, on this day of the Queen's Birthday Parade, they've decided to reduce it, as I say, to the, um, to the first element, the support helicopter force, and to the red arrows. So let's see if we can glimpse. Well, there's the red arrows, and that's a pretty spectacular display. And uh, Duke of Cambridge, Responding, let's listen to the roar. He's impressed. That was a what was that kind of look? <laughs> I think, I think, uh, father saying, uh. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was great. I think I saw the Duke go, wow. So the Red Arrows, having done their work spectacularly as ever, the Queen seems to have enjoyed that. And there, our glimpse of Prince George and his first appearance on this balcony for the Queen's birthday parade. Waves goodbye to the crowd. Prince Harry clearly enjoying himself too, and the Prince of Wales on the. Uh, Duchess of Cornwall too. A final thought from you gentlemen, Robert? Well, as ever, a great birthday parade, but Hugh, I can't help thinking that was a great one. Uh, next year, an even more important one, it will be Her Majesty's 90th birthday, and I think that's going to be sensational. As Robert said, what a wonderful way to finish with four generations on the balcony, and I look forward to Her Majesty's 90th parade next year. Well, the Queen and four generations of the royal family have made their way back into the palace and the birthday parade of 2015 is over. 
another consummate display by everyone on horse guards, by, by the Welsh guards certainly, and by an equally uh, masterful performance by the Royal Air Force to round off the day's events. Don't forget, you can enjoy it all again. Our highlights programme is on BBC Two this evening at six o'clock. But for now, from my special guests, Major General Richard Stanford and Robert Hardman, from my colleague Claire Balding and from all of the BBC team at Horse Guards, thanks for watching and goodbye.